Good morning, Grace Point. How is everybody? So good to be around people and fellowship with the, in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you can open your Bibles, did you bring your Bible on your phone or the written form? <laughs> Let's look at Psalms 121. Psalm 121, 1, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who slumbers over you, he who watches, excuse me, he who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The, the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen? Do you believe that? That's the word of the Lord. It does not change. So stand to your feet. Let's worship the Lord this morning. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance and I'm standing in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave. Behind, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. I fear doesn't stand a chance. Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I'm stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I'm stand in your There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can end the other grave. There's resurrection power that can save. Power in your name. Power in your name. Let's sing that again. There's power. Do you believe it? There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out of the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your I am standing on the rock. I am standing on the rock. I am standing in. Chance when I'm standing, Lord, my fear doesn't stand. 
firm rock that we can stand on. Amen. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Let it sink into our souls this morning. Hallelujah. Can we just pray for just a minute before we move on? Hallelujah. God, we invite your presence into this place, God. Your Holy Spirit, move, God. Lord, we want to give you glory and honor. We are here to serve and worship you, God. That is the reason we're here. We want to lift up your name and magnify your name, God, in this place. Hallelujah. Great is your name. Great is your faithfulness. We give you the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. What a mighty God you are. You are mighty God. It's the tearing down of every stronghold around us to the tearing down of every fear that has been creeping up into our spirits and our souls. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. You are the way maker.
are the way maker. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, out of the darkness, my God, come into worship you God that is who you are God you are our miracle worker God hallelujah even we, when we can't see what's happening God you are moving hallelujah you are moving in our midst father in our nation you are moving that is who you are God hallelujah you're faithful to your character you are faithful to your Thank you, God, that you still speak to us, God. Fresh, God, that we can hear from you. God, you desire to speak to your children. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just worship him this morning. I want to be close, close to your side. Heaven is risen. Death is a lie. I want to hear voices, angels above. 
singing as one. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, God beside me, God second verse again. Shaking in Jesus' name. The mountains shake before you. The demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great. Declare them leaving this area in Jesus' name. 
As we worship, the demons have to flee. They must run in the name of Jesus. They have no authority in this place. They must bow their knee. Hallelujah. If they've been speaking to you and, and tormenting you, you just tell them to get out in the name of Jesus. You have all authority in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 He is worthy, people. He is worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I roam, the mountain I drink from. Song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. Ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh. The king of my heart, be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the wind, oh, he's my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my dreams, oh, he's my song. You are good, good. that 
first verse again. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I roam, the mountain I dream from, all oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the mountain of Just tell the Lord what you love about him. Just sing a little love song between you and the Lord or just whisper it to him. Just tell him how much you love him. Thank him for saving your soul. Thank him for keeping you. God, I just thank you for your word, your rich word, your truth, God. Your truth, God, that upholds us, that is the anchor, God. says I've come to bring you home. I've come to bring my life into you today. I am your hope. I am your rock. I am your joy. so good. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just bow our heads just for a moment and just be still before him and allow his spirit to speak to our hearts just for a moment.
just thank you that you are so good to us. And Lord God, may your peace that's resting on this place right now fall upon each and every person here. Lord, for those who come in here this morning, that they're struggling, they're having a difficult time, may they right now be filled with the peace that passes all understanding. May you fill them with a comfort that they've never experienced before. May you fill them with that assurance that you are with them, that you haven't forsaken them. And Lord God, may you meet every one of their needs according to your riches and glory. And Lord, may your peace that passes all understanding just flow through their spirit right this very moment. And Lord, may you do great and mighty things in their lives. And Lord, also this morning we bring before you those in this room that need that physical touch. You tell us clearly in your word that you are our healer. And Lord God, for those that need that physical touch this morning, right where they're sitting or right where they're standing, we want to reach out and touch the hem of that garment and may that virtue begin to flow right this very moment. If you need that healing this morning, just by faith, reach out by faith and touch the hem of his garment right now. Touch him right now by faith. Lord Jesus, may that healing virtue flow right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, together we agree according to your word that by your stripes they have been healed because you sent your word to heal their diseases. We claim that healing right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We claim that healing right now. For those who are are, are, are needing deliverance this morning, Lord God, you're greater than the name of that thing that's binding them. And Lord, right now we speak life, liberty, and freedom. And we command those chains to be loosed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Chains come off right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, this morning we stand upon your word and upon your truth right now. For who the Son has set free is free indeed. Right now, saints, receive that freedom from your Lord right now. Receive that freedom from your Lord. He's given you that freedom. He's given you that deliverance. Depression, be gone in the name of Jesus. Discouragement, be gone in the name of Jesus. Fear, be gone in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let freedom and liberty rule and reign in this place right now. Right now, let freedom and liberty rule and reign in this place right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Praise his name. He is so good. Thank you, Jesus. You are good, Lord. Just begin just to tell him how good he is. Hallelujah. You are good, 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 isn't he? Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, Hallelujah. Pastor, can I share a, just a small little testimony? Go ahead. An hour later. Go ahead. Uh, it was last week, Ryan and I shared, um, we went to Oklahoma City for a little mini getaway to celebrate our 29th anniversary. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> uh, but, um, just the one thing I want to share with you, because God's been speaking to me, I think he used it as something that happened as an object lesson. Um, we, they have this new thing in Bricktown. And I don't know if you've been down there, but you, it's a water rapid thing. And so you, it's kind of like the water rapids in Colorado. And they actually, it's an Olympic training center. So 
it's kind of a real deal. So you have a guide, and then there's six people on the boat. So we did our first three laps, and he's like, man, you guys are doing really good as a group. Of course, we're with, we're with total strangers. We don't know these kids. We're the oldest people on the boat. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, he's like, hey, let's kick it up a notch the last time around. We're like, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so really quickly after we kicked it up a notch, all of a sudden, you know, the boat goes, boom, and we almost completely capsized. Of course, everybody in the boat went flying out of the boat except for Brian and I. <laughs> and, the, and the guy who I affectionately kid, call him the Nazarene. He went to <laughs> this Nazarene college down there. And so it was like, just Brian and I and the Nazarene were left in the boat. <laughs> um, because the reason we <laughs> stayed in was because we remembered the advice that he had given us if this ever happened, to get down in the boat. You literally get off the edge and you go, boom, you know? And so we were trying to center it and all that. But, but the object lesson I just want, I feel like God wanted us to share this morning, wanted me to share, is that now is the time for us as a body of Christ to get down in the boat of the word. We have got to get deep in the word of God. And that is our lifeline, and that is what is going to hold us steady. Jesus will guide us. Just like that guide, he guided the rest of us back safely, even though there were only three of us in that boat. He got us back. But it is our responsibility to get deep in the Word every single day. And that's what's going to keep the truth. It's going to keep us righted. So we're, everything that's coming against us through the media and, you know, junk, we will know what is truth and what is not true. We will know what to do. So anyway. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We definitely need to get deep in the boat. Praise God. Well, again, I want to welcome everyone to Grace Point Church, where your past doesn't define your future. It's good to be back together in the house of the Lord with brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? You know, there's many things going on right now, but one of the things I know for sure, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling yourselves together. You know why? There's power and authority when God's people come together. It encourages us. It lifts us up. It builds us up to face what's out there. And it's so important that we do meet together. And I, I'm believing that God's going to do great and mighty, mighty things in his church, even in the midst of what's going on. But I want to continue a series that we started. This is uh, Living the Abundant Life that Jesus came to give us. And this is going to be part four. And I started out with just one message here, and now we're at part four. So I don't know where it's going to go from here. But I do know one thing. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it what? more abundantly that's John 10 and 10 that's what he said and right before that was said it says the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly and the times we're living in right now I think it's very very obvious that the thief is coming to steal kill and destroy all we have to do is look around everything is going on and you can see the hand of the enemy at work but good news today Saints <laughs> when the hand of the enemy starts to move God raises a standard against it because Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And that more abundant life that he's given to us is going to give us power and authority over all the powers of hell, what the enemy's trying to do. And saints, we can have victory in the midst of everything that's going around. And right, the time we're living in right now is that I sense in my spirit, and I think most people would agree, that there is a spirit of fear coming upon this land. Everywhere you listen to, everything you see on, on the, the, the social media, the news, it just constantly brings us fear, 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 fear. And you have to understand something. Fear is a spirit. And that spirit of fear is trying to attach itself to us as individuals, trying to attach itself to this church, trying to attach itself to the church around us, and unsafe people. It's trying to attach them because unsafe, what fear will do, it will begin to tear down our faith, it will begin to tear down our trust in the Lord, and it will cause people that don't know Christ to turn away from God, period. And saints, when that fear begins to take over, because catastrophe can happen. I have good news for us today, and I'm going to quote that scripture again. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind. And that simply says to me is this, that we have the power in Jesus' name to pull down the principalities in power. We have power and authority in Jesus' name to tread upon the serpents and the scorpions. We have the power in Jesus' name not to walk in fear, but walk in the abundance that God has provided for us, even in the midst of COVID-19, even in the midst of all the things that are going around. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. How many believe that to be true? 
The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now dwells in our mortal bodies. In other words, you have the resurrection power of God dwelling in you today. And I love this one. If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, why am I saying these kind of things? Because I feel and sense the same things probably everyone else in this room feels at time to time. You listen to the news too long, you listen to the media too long, and the next thing you know, that's creeping in on you. <laughs> you need to rise up in Jesus' name and not take it. Remember that one song we sang, the demons have to flee? Well, I'm going to tell you, a spirit of flea needs to flee from God's people today. Amen. And with all that said, I'm not saying that, that the COVID-19 isn't a real thing. I'm not saying it's not real, but I know this. I trust my God. I believe in my God, and I am trusting and dependent upon him that when this is get, we're going to get through this thing, and we're going to be victorious on the other side, and we're going to see spiritual growth. We're going to see a mighty hand of God move and things are, that we've never seen before. I believe God is going to demonstrate his spirit strong and powerful in the midst of all this, and I think this is true, too. He's looking for a group of people to say, Lord, use me in the midst of all that's going on don't let me be bound by the fear don't let me be bound by all the things that I'm seeing but let me rise up in faith and trust and believe you to do your word I like the, his word his word said you know he said in his word his word is, is, is established forever in the heavens every little jot every little tittle that means every little comma every little period is going to come to pass and that's trustworthy and saints of God I can know what his word says you know one of these days he's gonna sound that trumpet and then the eastern sky, the eastern sky is gonna part hallelujah and he's going to come back for his church. And saints of God, he's going to come back for a church that's not just waiting around, but is watching for his return and is busy about his father's business in the midst of everything that's going on. Not huddling inside in fear, not being afraid to step out in faith, but trusting him to do what his word said he will do. And if we're busy about our father's business, I can tell you one of these days, we're going to have not a rapture drill, but we're going to have the real thing happen. And we're going to be ushered into the presence of Jesus forever and ever and ever. So you know what that means? No matter what's going on, we're still victorious. There is no reason for us to be walking in an abundance of fear when we can walk in an abundance of God's power and God's anointing on our lives each and every day. And that also means this to me. We've got to take it outside the church. We've got to take it outside the church. Not just keep it here when we're here, but take it outside the church and then start acting like we're victors instead of acting like we're victims in Jesus' name. Amen? Praise God. Well, that was an extra little bit. It wasn't in the notes, so God bless you in Jesus' name. <laughs> Whoever needed it, received it. And take it and accept it today. Amen? Praise God. So again, today's message, we're going back to this series, uh, Living the Abundant Life that Jesus Came to Give Us. And again, John 10 and 10, <laughs> I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And this is just a quick review. Our God is a God of abundance. Everything God does, he's done in abundance. And we've also learned in the last few weeks that if we respond to God into abundance, he responds back to us in abundance. If we, we follow him in devotion, he responds back to us in abundance. And no matter what we do for God, if we go in faith, believing and trusting, we respond to God in abundance, he responds back to us in abundance. And if you don't think he's a God of abundance, just look at creation and the stars and out there and the, the galaxies. And we don't even know how many there are, but he knows every single one of them by name. Hallelujah. And he's in control of everything. He is the God of abundance. And so this leads me to this message here, part number four in this series is he is the God of abundant grace. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, the word abundance means this. It means over and above in every possible way, a more than sufficient amount, extraordinary. And I, I think about this abundant grace that God has given to each and every one of us that know him as Lord and Savior. And the first thing that comes to my mind is this. His abundant grace gives me a way not to be separated from him for eternity. And because of his abundant grace, I know I'm in his care. I know he's taking care of me. But ultimately, one of these days, I'm going to see him face to face in all his glory. I'm going to kneel before his throne one day, and I'm going to cast my crown. I believe I got a crown. I hope you all have some crowns too. And we're going to worship our Lord and Savior, and we're going to join with all of creation. We're going to cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is the abundant grace that our God has for us. He's made a way for us to be with him for all eternity. And that's all if that was all the abundant grace provided for us that's all we needed 
but his abundant grace provides for more and more and more than we can even begin to imagine. His abundant grace, you ready for this, gives us all that we need for right now and the life that we're living in. His abundant grace gives you all that you need right this very moment to face the COVID-19 situation. His abundant grace gives you everything that you need to be victorious in every situation in your life. In other words, saints, you don't have to be defeated. You don't have to be the victim. You can be the victor because Christ has given you his abundant grace. Overflowing, exceeding, abundantly above all you think, ask, or even imagine. But there's one thing I have discovered in, in many Christians is this. Many Christians don't understand God's abundant grace. It's hard for us to understand this grace because, saints, we operate in a different system than God. Anyone know what I'm talking about here? Our system it, we operate under is one that simply says this. It's the American way of life. And what we, we believe is simply is this, in the American way of life, and I'm not pitting down the American way of life. I'll, I'll, I'll bring this back here in just a moment. You know, the American dream, the American way of life. And what we believe in, as Americans is this, you get what you earn in life. In other words, you have to work for what you need. You have to work for what you want. You have to work to have the house. You have to have work to go to college. You have to work. And you get what you earn while you work. How many understand what I'm talking about there? I uh, say, at least my generation and under, that's what we believed, is what we were taught. And, and we also learned this, that if you make your own bed, you're the one that's going to have to lie in it. We also uh, believe this, that there's value in competition, you know, uh, and there's value in winning. There's that value in the hard work, and there's value in that hard work where you use your elbow grease, and, and there's value in that sweat equity. In other words, we have been taught very, very carefully, I think as young people, in my generation at least and below, that it is important that we be not lazy people and that we work to produce the things that we need in our lives. And I don't see anything wrong with that work ethic. As a matter of fact, I find that work ethic in the Bible. Go back to the garden. You know, if it had been my idea of the garden, we'd have been sitting back and just having a good time. But no, they still had to work the garden. They had to till the garden. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if a man don't work, he don't eat. And if you want to talk about lazy people, go to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs clearly says what the lazy person is like and what they're going to do and what the things they're going to receive. But it also then shows you awesome things that those who are, have a work ethic, who work hard, will receive from God. It's a great and mighty thing to happen. And then we also look at our own lives personally. Because when it comes to grace, we have this idea, before I can give you grace, you have to earn your grace. Anyone resemble that? I think we've all been there. If someone comes to us and asks forgiveness, and, and the thing we say is this, you know, prove it. Change your situation. Do something different. And then when you meet my expectations of what you should do to really be sorrowful and to really have repented of what you've done to me, then I'll offer you my grace. And when it comes to God's grace, we take the American ethic and we take our personal view of grace and we try to impose that upon God's way of operating in the kingdom of God. And guess what? They don't operate that way. God operates in a total different system than the American way and our way. And all I can say is, thank God that he does. Thank God that he does. And God deals with us with his abundant grace and the kingdom principles of his grace, his mercy, and his love. Not the American way, and thank God not your way. Amen? Isn't God good, saints? So I want to look at some truths about God's abundant grace. And I know probably most of us know this already, but sometimes we need to be reminded of these things. And the first truth is this. God is abundantly gracious to all people. Psalms 145 and 8 says this, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, and I like this last part, slow to anger and of great mercy. Praise his holy name. That means God loves to be abundantly gracious to all of us. God loves to bless his people who don't deserve it. Being abundantly graceful 
to mankind is in God's nature. You know how I know that? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We need to be so glad that God blesses people who don't deserve it. Amen? And saints of God, that is sometimes hard for us to comprehend because it's so different from the way we operate and the way that we think. Amen? And because of this fact, I want us to understand there isn't one of us that deserves one iota of God's blessing, his care, his love, and his mercy. None of us deserve it. But God is a God of abundant grace, and his heart is filled for love, uh, filled with love for you and I and all mankind. You ready for this? He loves the Democrats. He loves the Republicans. He loves the independents. He loves the protesters. He loves those in prison. He loves those who are black, who are white. Amen. He loves all nationalities. He loves everybody. He loves the sinner. And he has an abundance of love and grace and mercy for whosoever will. And we need to be very, very, very grateful for that abundant grace that he has for us. And what this also ought to do, stop us from being judgmental toward others who don't meet our expectations, who don't live up to our standards, and that we don't agree with. Amen? See, God's abundant grace is the heart of our faith. Without his grace, we have nothing. With his grace, we have all his abundance. Hallelujah. God's abundant grace is the heart of our relationship with God. Without his grace, there's no relationship with him. And we need to understand God's grace and the more we understand God's grace, the more we're going to feel closer to God. And here's something I think it happens. When you don't understand God's grace, it's hard to feel close to God because you're constantly feeling condemned, not by God, but by yourself and the enemy. You see, when I understand God's grace, his abundant grace towards me, all the lies of the enemy mean nothing anymore. Every accusation, every lie he throws, to my, throws at me against me, it's not true because I know the God of abundant grace. I know his grace. I know his love and his mercy. I know his forgiveness. And because I know that forgiveness then, there is now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. So I, then my relationship with him grows closer and closer and closer. And I feel closer to God because I understand I am a product of his amazing grace. Amen? You see, the more I understand God's grace, the closer I can draw to God. Because I don't feel, again, judged and condemned. I know I can go to him as my Abba Father. I know I can go into his presence. I know he will accept me and not reject me. And I know he won't call me by my failures. But he'll call me by his son's name. Amen. You see, saints of God, the more I understand grace, the more I fall in love with Jesus. Because I begin to realize how much he has forgiven me. And the more you understand how much you've been forgiven, the greater your love will be towards him. Thank God for his abundant grace. Amen? Hallelujah. And I think one more important thing about understanding grace here, the more I understand God's abundant grace, the more thankful I am. One of the signs of the end times is this. There will be unthankful people. Unthankful, unholy, unrighteous. You know why that is? They don't understand God's abundant grace. And if I understand God's abundant grace, guess what? I'm thankful that he saved me. He's redeemed me. He's called me my name. I am so thankful that my name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm so thankful that he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I'm so thankful he is my healer, my deliverer, my savior, my all in all. I am so thankful that one of these days... <laughs> Not, not just not going to experience his presence here. I experience his presence here, but one of these days, I'm going to be in his presence forever and ever and ever. And the more we understand this abundant grace, the more thankful we will be. And the more we understand uh, God's abundant grace, the more we're going to live in the life that Jesus came to give to us. Amen? 
some definitions of grace. I found several definitions, and, and there's no one single definition that can explain grace. I mean, you just can't, okay? And one definition of God's grace is this, God's love in action. Another definition is this, God giving me what I need, not what I deserve. Another definition of grace is this, grace is the face God wears when he looks at my failures and he responds in a gracious way. Uh, you know, those are all kind of good definitions of grace, but they don't cover all of God's grace. Amen? And, but we also under, need to understand the difference between God's abundant grace and God's abundant mercy. And mercy, and it should be on the screen up here, mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve, which is punishment. But grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve, blessing amen hallelujah for his amazing abundant grace leads me to number two here the next fact about god's abundant grace is this it's not by it is by god's abundant grace that we are saved and not of works and i know if you've been around uh, the church very very long you hear that over and over and over again ephesians 2 and 8 says this for by grace are you saved through faith that, and, that, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. Now, I want you to point, hold on to that word, gift of God. Amen? Okay. We are saved by grace. Will everyone agree with me with that? Then I want to say this. If we are saved by grace, start acting like it. Start acting like you're a child of God, an heir of God, and a joint heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. Start acting like you are a child who's under the blessing and the anointing and, and the mercy of God. Start acting like you are a child that has been saved by the abundant grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and, and I know we all know that, but sometimes our thinking gets out of whack. Sometimes our thinking gets out of whack, and we may, we've heard it for years, we've heard it for years, we know we're, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, but somehow we get into our mind, it goes back again to the American culture and our own personal things, that it can't be that easy. It just simply can't be that easy. I can't come to God and ask Him to forgive me. He cleanses me of all my sins from all of His unrighteousness. He takes my sins and drops them in the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. It can't be that easy. I have to do something to earn it. And you know what? That happens. When that happens, we start acting like that. We get caught up in trying to please God legalistically. Amen? We try to somehow earn this great abundant grace. And how we do that is sometimes that we, we, we come up with these silly, stupid rules. We come up with these silly, stupid things that have nothing to do with Scripture, that have nothing to do with God. But if I can just do these things, somehow God will accept me because it can't be that easy. And they say, you know what, man, if I could only live perfectly before God, then he'll accept me. Can I tell you a truth right now? <laughs> there is no way any of us can live perfectly before God. Can't do it on our own. We don't have the strength and we don't have the power. We don't have the ability because whether you like it or not, you have a fallen sin nature. And from time to time, that stinking fallen sin nature pops up its head and reveals itself in a big, ugly way. And there's only one man who was ever perfect on this earth, and they crucified him. We can't do it. We cannot work ourselves to a place of perfection. I know some of you may think so, but it's not true. We cannot be perfect no matter how much we get into legalism, no matter how we try to earn our own salvation. It simply cannot happen. Now, does that mean I shouldn't strive to, to please God? I'm not saying that at all. We should strive to please God, not to earn our salvation, but because we simply love him. We should strive to follow God's moral laws, not because I'm trying to work my way into heaven, but because I love my God and my Savior and my Deliverer, and I don't want to hurt Him. It's not a matter of thou shalt not anymore. It's that I don't want to anymore because I've discovered God's amazing grace. Amen? Hallelujah. We don't do these things to bring our own salvation. We do these things to please our Lord and Savior because He has provided our salvation. We want to honor Him. Amen? See, we almost have the idea that God is like an unpleasant parent. He's got this clipboard up in heaven, and he's looking down at us. Oh, 
There is one negative. Oh, that's a positive. They cussed out their mom. Oop, there's a negative. Oh, they were so kind to their neighbor and helping shovel the snow in the middle of summer. No, it's okay. <laughs> and we thank God's up there with this checklist. Every negative, every negative, every negative, every positive, every positive and positive. And if somehow, when it's all said and done, if we have more positives than negatives, we're going to hear, come on in. And there are too many Christians living in that kind of fear, that kind of bondage, because we think we have to do all these things to be perfect for God to accept us. And we forget we're accepted in Him because of Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. And, and, and we have to get past that idea of us being worthless, of us being no good because of things we may have done in the past. You know what? <laughs> you are now the righteousness of God in Christ. Not some future date right now. You are the righteousness of God in Christ right this very moment, whether you feel like it or not. And whether you feel like it or not, you are a victor because Jesus Christ has declared us to be victors. And we got to start acting like we are people who are walking in God's abundance, grace, His mercy. We need to walk in God's abundance right this very moment. In the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of family troubles, in the midst of work troubles, in the midst of an economy that you don't know what's going on, in the midst of an election that's coming up. I can tell you right now, if you start focusing on all that nonsense, you will be down, discouraged, and in despair. But you've got to look to what Jesus has done for us. And I'm going to walk in God's abundance no matter what the doctor's report is. I'm going to walk in God's abundance no matter what the news media is saying. I'm going to walk in God's abundance because I'm an heir of God and a joint heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to walk in His abundance. You see, saints of God, when I really begin to understand God's abundance, the joy of the Lord begins to take over my life. I begin to trade that mourning and heaviness for the joy of the Lord. And I can tell you there's a lot of mourning and there's a lot of heaviness going on out there today. But I'm not going to receive it. I'm not going to walk, walk in it. And you say, well, Pastor, have you done this the whole time perfectly? No, I'm just like you. There's times it hits. There's times it discourages. There's times it like it. And you know what? That's nonsense. I am going to walk in God's abundance. Who's going to join me in that abundance? Amen. Praise God. Leads me to the third point this morning is this. God's abundant gr grace is a free gift to us. I know these two points kind of go together, but I wanted to make sure we got that free gift to us. How many like free things? <laughs> every one of us likes free things. If they were giving away free kittens, probably everyone in the church would go grab one. <laughs> well, maybe that was a poor illustration. <laughs> But yeah, donuts, yeah, they would boom. <laughs> you know, all of us like free things usually. We like free things. <laughs> so let's start liking the free abundant grace that God's given to us. Amen? Now, Romans 3 and 24 says, being justified freely, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this isn't up there, but I want to throw this word freely at you just for a moment. Freely means this here, without cost, undeservedly, without a cause, or without reason. In other words, he just simply gives it to us because he loves us, freely. I like freely, okay? But also this word justified, and I like this word justified. It means acquitted. Hallelujah. It's to be declared righteous and rendered innocent. Now, that's not up there, so y'll I'll say it again. It means to be acquitted, declared righteous, and rendered innocent. <laughs> Hallelujah. Saints of God, when we understand God's abundant grace, you have been acquitted. What have you been acquitted from? All the past failures and all the past sins. You are acquitted, hallelujah. And it means this, we have been declared righteous. And I've said this already, God looks at you and you, he looks at you as the righteousness of God in Christ. He has imputed to you the son's righteousness to you. He has given him your, his righteousness. And when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your life. Start acting like it. Amen? And then I've been rendered, rendered innocent. And this is where we have trouble with grace. How can I be innocent? All my past failures, I'll tell you why. Because when God the Father looks at me, he doesn't look at my past failures. He looks at his son. 
And then my God has removed my sins as far as the east is from the west. And I know, you'll, I know I've used this illustration a lot. It didn't say I removed your sins from the North Pole to the South Pole. You know why? Because I can go to the North Pole. I can go to the South Pole. But there is no West Pole and there is no East Pole. So I can, as far as I go West, I'm never going to find East. And as far as I go East, I'm never going to find West. Because that's how far our sins have been removed from us. That's how he can declare us innocent because of his amazing, abundant grace. And he does it free of charge to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why we've got to get rid of that idea of the American work ethic, uh, God dealing with us with grace and our own ideas of grace, because God deals with us separately. I guarantee you, if you walked out on the sidewalk today, you went outside and asked people, how do you get to heaven? I almost guarantee you, you'd hear people say, I've just got to work a little harder. I've got to be a little kinder. I've got to do more good than I do bad. And I want to tell you right now, you can't get into heaven by any of those things. It, we get into heaven because we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. And that gift is absolutely free to each and every one of us. And here's what makes Christianity different from all other religions. Is that we have a faith system that's based in grace. All other religions have a work system where somehow you have to work hard enough, do certain things to please their, quote, G, small God. But our God has given us a different system, and it's called grace. We do not have to work for it. We have to receive it as a free gift. Every other religion is based on works. Again, you have to do the rules, the regulations, the rituals. There's one group that comes knocking at your door every once in a while that believes this, that if they work hard enough, there will be one of the 144,000 chosen to go to heaven. The problem is their denomination is larger than 144,000, so they got a problem. So, you know what? Only those 144,000 who work the hardest get to go to heaven, and the rest of them work hard to stay here at the earth because they're going to inherit this earth. I have good news for you. When I see the pictures around the throne room in heaven, they're un, there's, they can't even be numbered, the people up there, hallelujah. And you know what? And it has nothing to do with what I have done. It has everything to do with what he has done. He has provided everything. You know, you can sum up all other religions as doing. They have to do, do, do. You can sum up as Christianity as done, done, done. Because our salvation has already been provided for. Our salvation was already bought when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Jesus paid in full our debt. That's why the scriptures, why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, which means in the Greek, paid in full. All my debt sins have been paid in full. All your debt sin has been paid in full. And because of his abundant grace and mercy, he has given us a new life. We are no longer the old creations that we were, but we're new creations in Christ Jesus. I thank God. God, that Jesus paid in full my debt for, sal debt for my sins so now I can have the free gift of salvation without trying to figure out how I'm going to earn it and work for it because it can never be done any other way. Amen? A pastor, asked, uh, asked, uh, a pastor had a guy ask him, Pastor, what can I do to be saved? And the pastor replied, you're too late. The man was shocked. And the pastor went on, you see, you need to go back 2,000 years ago. You need to understand that your salvation was purchased 2,000 years ago. It's already been purchased. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. All you have to do is receive it and accept it. And that's God's abundant grace and mercy. Why did Jesus hang on the cross? Well, it's very, very simple. When he said, I am, when he said it is finished, what he was saying is this. I'm not finished. He didn't say that. He said, it was finished. What was the it? Our salvation. It was finished. Hallelujah. I'm glad he's not finished. I'm still he, glad he's still the great I am, not the great I was. I am still the great I am. And Jesus has provided salvation and grace for every person who needs it, who will receive it as a free gift. Um, we are getting to heaven we are not getting to heaven based on, on what we do. We are getting to heaven based on what he has already done for us by Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. The greatest gift ever 
is this grace of abundant, his, his abundant grace is one of the greatest gifts ever. Leads me to Roman numeral number three. God's gift of grace is received by faith. Say faith. Faith. Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, faith is the key that I believe that unlocks the blessings of heaven. Amen? Salvation is a gift that's received by faith. If I were to offer you today a brand new car, and I had the keys right here, and I said, the car belongs to you, and I'm placing the keys here, it's your car. What do you have to do? You have to come up and grab the keys. You have to have faith, number one, that I will give you the keys. You have to have faith, number two, that the keys are going to unlock, are going to start that engine. You have to have faith, okay? And, and, and in this abundant grace, we need to understand that we have to have faith that he's going to provide for my future needs, my present needs, whatever it is. His grace is abundant to take care of everything and every issue that I'm going to face in my life. Now, why did God do it by a gift? So we can't boast. How many have been around boasters? After you've heard them for a few minutes, what do you begin to think? You begin to like, I got to get out of here because it's getting awful deep in here. But because it's a gift and not by works, when we get to heaven, we can't start bragging and saying, do you know what I had to do to get to heaven? You know how many people I had to serve to get to heaven? And we all begin to start telling stories and we try to up one on their story. And we begin to brag about our own faith and our own works and our own abilities to get ourselves to heaven. And that's why God said, you know what? I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'm paraphrasing here. I'm going to give it to you as a free gift. So you can't boast that you have to understand and realize the only reason you're here is because of my great love, my great mercy, and my abundance love for you. So when we get to heaven, we have to humble ourselves before our Lord, not boast to be boasting before our Lord, because it's only by his grace and his mercy that we're ever going to walk on the streets of gold. It's a free gift that he's given to us. Amen? Praise God. Um, therefore, uh, Romans 4 and 16, Therefore, if it's of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all seeds. And I think salvation is something that we have to be careful that salvation, we don't base it on our performance. We base salvation on God's promise. Amen. Salvation is not based on our goodness. Salvation is based on God's grace and goodness. We are not getting to heaven based on our own merit, but on God's mercy and his merit and grace. That's why God gets all the credit, all the glory. There's nothing we can do to receive. There's nothing we can do to make our way to heaven except receive his mercy, receive his grace by faith. Amen? Hallelujah. The next thing about God's abundant grace is this. God's abundant grace still provides abundant salvation to anyone who will receive it. And I know I already kind of hit this up a little bit already, but God's abundant grace isn't limited to the white church. God's abundant grace isn't based on someone's skin color. God's abundant grace is not based on our past backgrounds. God's abundant grace is not based on our status in society. God's abundant grace is not based on our past sins. Glory to God. It doesn't matter if you were a religious person or a non-religious person. God's abundant grace is simply based upon his love for whosoever will. And it's not limited to who we think can be saved and can't be saved. Now, I know none of you have ever done something like that, right? I was at one church uh, that... Um, had actually someone tell me that that person had no redemptive value and God couldn't save them. And I wanted to step back and say, watch for the fire. Because that person who you just said had no redemptive value was still made in the image of God. That person you said had no redemptive value can still have his life changed just like that through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they may have done in the past. I don't care what they may look like. I don't care what they may smell like. God still loves them, even if they are different than we are. Amen? Praise God. He's good, isn't he? Hallelujah. You know what that says to me? God has no quotas in heaven. 
we have quotas here, and most of us don't think quotas are fair because they're not fair. But God doesn't have quotas. It's for whosoever will. Isn't it good, saints? The next thing I want to look at here, and I'm, I'm going to speed through here, the next fact about God's abundant grace is this. God's abundant grace comes through Jesus Christ. You say, well, I already know that. Well, I want to remind us a little bit. John 1 and 17 says this, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, why did it say that grace and truth and mercy came through Jesus Christ? Why didn't it say it come through Buddha? Why didn't it say it come through Joseph Smith? Why didn't it say it comes from uh, uh, out on a limb somewhere? You know, why did it say it came through Jesus Christ? It was very, very simple. Buddha didn't pay the price. Joseph Smith didn't pay the price. Those false cults didn't pay the price. But Jesus Christ did pay the price. And because he did pay the price, all this comes through Jesus Christ. On the cross, thank God he said it was finished. You know, the law tells us what we did wrong, where we blew it. <laughs> but grace and mercy forgives us and tells us how to get back on the right path. Hallelujah. Romans 15 and 5. Much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many. Thank God. Now, think about this. And just, I'm not trying to put anyone down here, but think about over your life here just for a moment that how many of our lives we have done something wrong and we feel that one thing we've done wrong has disqualified us to go to a perfect heaven. Now think about how many times that you have made bad choices and ripped up your life and say, there's no way God could save me from that. There's no way God could accept me back from all this. And how many things, the things you think about in your life that you're ashamed of? And you say, I don't want to even think about this. I definitely don't want no one else to know about these things. I'm ashamed of all these things. And, and you think about this, you know, I don't want anyone to know what I have done. I don't want anyone to know how I have hurt someone. I don't want to know people know how, uh, how I have hurt other people. I don't want other people to know the things I have committed and how my actions have been so terrible and how I've totally messed up my life. All the mistakes. Kind of feels down and discouraged, doesn't it? But can I tell you right now, when we come to God, we receive that abundant grace, mercy, and forgiveness. He sees no more imperfections. He doesn't see those things that you're ashamed of any longer. All those choices that you made that ripped up your life, he doesn't remember them. He chooses not to. Because, hear me, this important word, we are in phrase, in Christ. You see, this phrase, in Christ, is used 120 times in the New Testament. And when those people come to know, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And what that means now, I've been translated from Satan being my Lord, my Master and Savior, which people get frightened over, and they should be. Now Jesus is my Lord, my Master, and my Savior, and now I'm in Christ. And when the Father again looks down at me, he sees me in Christ. He doesn't see me in my imperfections. He doesn't see me in my failures. That is amazing, abundant grace. And that's why we have a hard time with that. Because we don't see that way. We always look at other people and remember their failures, remember their sins, remember this. And you got to work and make it right to me. And if you work hard enough, maybe I'll give you grace and mercy. But when we're in Christ, it's already been given to us. And saying to God, it's so, so important that we be in Christ. When we look at what God has done for us, wow. Wow. Galatians 2 and 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I'm going to stop there right there just for a moment. How many have ever been frustrated? Some of you may be frustrated right now thinking he's going way too long, right? <laughs> I've been frustrated. But did you know you can frustrate the grace of God? And I got thinking about that. How do I frustrate the grace of God? And the number one thing was this, not live in it. Don't live in it. Another way we can frustrate the grace of God is this, 
to turn away from the grace that he's given to us. Saints, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. Another version says it this way, and it's not going to be up there. Don't treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if we could be saved by keeping the law, there was no need for Christ to die. We frustrate the grace of God by not receiving Jesus' sacrifice for us and living in that truth. God is good, isn't he? Amen. And one more point here. The next fact about God's abundant grace is this. God's grace, ready for this, will last throughout all eternity. I like, how many like getting those warranties on your new car? My warranty on my new my car is not new anymore, but it's got 100,000 miles or 10 years. I can guarantee you what's going to happen at 100,001 miles. Something's going to go wrong. You know what I'm talking about? That guarantee, you know, and I guarantee you it's only a temporary warranty. It's only going to last for so long. The warranty you have on your new appliances, if you get one anymore, it's you know, maybe a year or two years. It only lasts for a certain amount of time. But I have a warranty that's going to last through all eternity. How long is all eternity? I don't know, but I know I have a warranty that's going to last through all eternity, and it's called God's grace, His abundant grace. It's going to keep us through all eternity. Now, can I comprehend all of eternity? I can't accomplish, comprehend all of eternity, but I can trust God for it. Romans 6 and 23 says this, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, how many realize sin has a wage? Yes, it does. And that wage is spiritual death. It also can cause physical death. There's a wage for it. But having faith in God, that abundant grace gives us a gift of life for all eternity. Isn't that great, saints of God? Eternal life is one of the benefits of, uh, of God's abundant grace. Hallelujah. Now, just think about heaven for a moment. I haven't been there yet. Anyone been there yet? I haven't been like the Apostle Paul who's had the vision, gone up there, the, 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 up in the heavens. I haven't had that yet, but I know Jesus has. He's been there and back. I mean, and been back and went back again. But some things about heaven, I'm going to be real quick here. And number one thing about heaven, it's a place of reunion where we are going to be reunited with loved ones who have accepted the grace of God. Number two about heaven is this. Heaven is a place of reward. Whether you realize it or not, as we, learn, as we serve God, as our character begins to change and mature in the things of God, we are going to receive rewards for what we've done to help people down here. Do I understand all that? No, but that's what the Bible teaches. We're going to have rewards. A third thing about heaven is this. We're going to rule and reign with our Lord. Hallelujah. That is awesome by itself. And number four, heaven is going to be a place of release from all pain, all suffering, all sadness, all sorrow, all COVID-19, all depression, all loneliness. It's going to be a place, a place of total, total release. Hallelujah. 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 Peter Ducker at this time was 90 years old, and he was known as the father of, the Ameri of American management. He was asked, how did you become a Christian? His response was, when someone first explained grace to me, I realized I will never get a better deal than that. And there's where we need to be. We'll never get a greater deal than the grace of God. Amen. Isn't he good, saints of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, can it be that easy? It can be that easy. I'll give you an example, and I'm going to close with this example. There was a lady who was caught in the very act of adultery. And she was caught by, quote, the religious people. And the religious people grabbed her, if you want to say by the nap of the neck, threw her before Jesus and said, Jesus, we've caught this lady. She has sinned. And I always think it's interesting. They didn't bring both of them, just the one. 
shows you kind of prejudice there said we've caught her in this great immoral type of sin what does the law say and they knew what the law said the law said that she should be stoned to death they both should have been stoned to death but what did our Jesus do he looked at him and said you who are without sin cast the first stone and I believe the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because the great I am is standing right before him they dropped their stones one by one and walked out of the room but who didn't walk out of the room Jesus you know why because he was the perfect one he was the one without sin and if anyone had a right anyone had a right to stone her it would have been him but you know what he did he held her he held up her dignity even in the midst of what she had done he asked this question where are thy accusers and she responded they're gone you know what that means Jesus was there he wasn't accusing her and Jesus said neither do I and at that moment in time, she was forgiven. Now, at that point in time, most of us would be thinking, all right, here comes the lecture to tell me every detail, everything that I've done wrong, all of these things, the lecture's coming. There was no great lecture. He just simply said, your sins be forgiven, and now go and sin no more. No lecture, no judgment, no condemnation. Because God's abundant grace is that easy. It's that easy. And we've got to get that mindset. How his abundant grace. We can walk in it, change our lives. It's not the American idea. It's not our idea. But God's economy, which is totally different. Thank God for his abundant grace. Amen. And if we'll grab a hold of that. It will change our life and our relationship with Jesus and change our world. I'd like every head to be bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around just for a moment. You may be here this morning or watching online. And you may be right now questioning things that you heard this morning. Can God really, really, really come into my life, be my Lord and Savior, and forgive me by me simply coming to him in faith? The enemy right now is trying to tell you it can't be that way. You have to earn it. You have to work for it. But I'm here to declare what God said. It's a gift from him. For the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here this morning, and you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You say, I want to walk in His grace. I want to walk in His mercy. I don't want to walk in the condemnation of my past any longer. I want to be set free. Right this very moment, He's calling to you and speaking to you. And saying, receive my free gift. If you need God's grace and mercy this morning, I just want you to raise your head and look at me just for a moment. Yes, there's one there. Someone else. I need God's grace and his mercy. There's another one there. Someone else. Someone else this morning. I'd like for you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I come to you right now and I present myself to you with all my hurts all my pains and all my failures and I ask right now Lord for your abundant grace for your abundant mercy and your abundant forgiveness Lord Jesus I confess that now you are my Lord and Savior Lord Jesus, help me to walk in this new life, to live for you, 
and to serve you because of my love for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this gift. I thank you, Lord, that you love me. And I thank you, Lord God, for a fresh new start. In your name we pray. And all God's people who agreed said, amen, amen. If you said that prayer with me this morning and sincerely meant it, I have good news for you. You're a new creation of Christ Jesus this very moment. And also in heaven, there's a celebration going on. Because the scripture says when one comes to him, all of heaven celebrates. So you know what we need to do this morning? Let's give the Lord a praise offering for what he's done. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I just want to say one more thing before we, we're dismissed here. If you are in that place where you're trying to earn it, leave that here and begin to walk in the freedom that Jesus has already given to you. He's already purchased that for you. Now walk in that abundance in Jesus' name. God bless you in Jesus' name.